everyone. Uh, it's not the 10 a.m. Leadership Live today. We switched it up to 1 p.m. So hopefully everyone's awake and has some lunch in them. So we're going to begin here shortly. Um, if Andrew can start up the presentation, uh, we always like to start and explain why we offer Leadership Live for anyone who is new on the call. And at Rosewood, our why is to multiply the blessing and opportunities that have been put onto our trust and allowing our employees to better themselves through Leadership Live is one of the many ways we achieve this purpose. Um, so for this quarter, uh, we are in quarter four, the November session, and we are going to be talking about employee experiencing experience and changing mindsets. And by doing that, Andrew is going to be talking about changing mindsets and moving from me to we, which a lot of us can relate to that since it's one of our core values. And so Andrew, whenever you want to begin, you can kick us off and, uh, yeah, floor is yours. Sweet. Good morning, every. No, nope, it's afternoon. You already said that, Antonio. Uh, I'm really glad to be with y'all today. Uh, my name is Andrew Florence. I work at an organization called Cross North Communities for Children. I'm based in Winston Salem, North Carolina. Uh, I'm the director of experiential learning, so I get to oversee all of our team building efforts uh, across our three campuses um, and also with the public as well as our experiential learning with our children and families uh, and really looking at the different ways that we connect to ourselves connect to each other uh, to get to the work that we're after um, to give you an idea of who i am i am also a faculty member for the center for trauma resilient communities which is our within Crossnord is our, our training branch of the organization. And so I've trained uh, nonprofits, corporate entities, schools across the Southeast and across the Eastern United States for uh, about 15 years now on how to implement strategies, practices, uh, and norms to, to build connective uh, organizations and teams that help us um, ride through adversity and get to where we want to go. So, hey Andrew, yes. I uh, said to interrupt. Uh, just quick, uh, your the screen, um, um, the PowerPoint is only showing, I would say about maybe seventy five percent of the screen. I don't know okay. if you can uh, update that. Yes. Cool. And also, uh, the chat is open, guys. So, if you guys have any questions or anything like that, the chat is open. Yes. Thank you, Kiana, for shouting out that I am typically on Zoom, uh, so. If, uh, if any of this is clunky, I'm uh, learning some new technology today. I appreciate y'all's patience. And please do, if there's any comments that you have or thoughts you have um, as we're going through today, I would love to hear your feedback. Today's going to be pretty interactive. There we go. That better? Okay. Awesome. Again, thank you so much. Um, so, in the United States, we have a really individualist uh, culture, and so a lot of the ways that uh, that we're going to be talking about today of of being connected and moving from that that mindset of me and um, the singular and shifting towards the collective well being is going to really in, uh, encourage us to move towards collectivism and different ways of looking around the world at collectivist cultures to understand different ways of being. So. Here in the middle, we've got three words that come from uh, from Zulu, uh, Ubuntu, Sawabona, and Jikona. It's really helpful for us to see other ways of being so that we might understand how we can relate to each other and find new ways of being. So Ubuntu is this idea, which was made popular here in the States by Nelson Mandela and uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu during the, uh, the apartheid era in, in South Africa and during the Truth and Reconciliation Commission the idea of Ubuntu is that I am because you are. My well-being is independent or interdependent on your well-being. Without you, I can't survive. And Sawabona is a, a greeting that means I see you and you are important to me. And the answer to that is Jikona, which means I am here. So I invite you as we think about these concepts today and we think into practice, I invite you into to recognizing that we belong to each other. So there's that, that center concept. Uh, those those collectivist words for us. And also there on the left is a phrase, connection before content, which comes from an author named Peter Block. Peter Block wrote a book called Community. And 
this idea of connection before content is that before we get into the business of what we're together to do, before every meeting, we have to connect to each other. We have to connect to ourselves and we have to connect to our work. What's our purpose? Why are we a team? What's the reason that this meeting is important and how powerful it is for us to, to center that and our intention at the beginning of the meeting so that we're clear on what, what's our outcome. We've all been in meetings that should have not been meetings, but they should have been, should have been emails, right? And if we shift that, that mindset of diving straight into content, if we dive first into connection to ourselves, each other, and to our work, then I think we can shift some of the paradigms of um, making sure that we understand why we're a team and why we're together. So um, as we're talking about empathy today, we're going to use a tool called the climber cards to check in. So I'm we're using the science, we're using the tools to teach the tools. So this right here, these are uh, our physical cards, but also I have a virtual way for us to use them. So if you go to that link that I just dropped into the chat, you should be able to pull up this page. And you can scroll through all of these different cards here and think about the, 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 the prompt here. I want you to look at these cards and select a card that represents how does empathy, empathy show up for you in the workplace. So today we're the kind of the core concepts. We're talking about empathy and engagement in the workplace. How does that show up for you? So you'll click a card if you feel like this flower represents that. You can click that card, type in your name, and then give us a, a little, you know, a couple of words, give us a sentence about how empathy shows up for you in the workplace. And if anybody, if that uh, link is not working, if you'd shout out, let me know. It's in the chat. Amy Clymer is a trainer and facilitator based out of Asheville. She made all these cards. She does a lot of work on creativity in the workplace. A lot of times we can think about concepts like empathy and engagement and communication in a lot of didactic ways. We think about it with words uh, and using images can help unlock and give some uh, give some flesh to these concepts. So click that link that's in the chat, pull up these cards, think about what is how does empathy show up for you in the workplace? Click that card. Kelly said, trying to understand until you get it right. I love that, Kelly. And I love the the arrows there that, you know what, we're not always going to get it right. And that's okay. It's okay if we don't we don't hit the and, and we shouldn't expect ourselves to hit the, the middle of the target every time. Nick Lay said, because uh, I have a hard time being verbally empathetic. Thanks, Nick. Thanks for being specific there uh, and for bringing that home for, for uh, yourself. Sometimes translating that feeling into words can be, can be hard. Meredith said, show connection. Uh, empathy shows connection and overlapping of ideas, projects, spaces. I love that, Meredith. And also the, the opportunity, I, I love the, the metaphor of these colors uh, and the primary colors. And then when you overlap those ideas, projects, spaces, we create something that's new. We, we get green, <laughs> but we don't get green unless we cross over yellow and blue. Perfect, thanks, Meredith. Edward said, it makes me think of people sharing the work and appreciating my contribution contributions to the work. Yeah, thank you. Beverly said, I can feel when something is off with my team. Yeah, Beverly. You may not have words for it, but you can feel it. You can feel, you know what, today something we, we need to shift maybe, what's our MO? Maybe we need to, to, to tend to um, some individual and collective needs. Thomas, which direction to navigate towards to reach your goal? Yes, thanks, Thomas. Byron, I want to see and understand what you're feeling or experiencing. Lori, I understand your frustration. Let's work together to figure it out. Nice. 
octopuses are brilliant. If you have kids, uh, this is a side note, I have a six-year-old and a four-year-old. Uh, there's a new podcast called Terrestrials, and they did a really cool episode on octopuses and how smart they are. A great listen if you need something uh, and you're traveling soon. Kathy said, by listening to others and attempting to see their perspective. Nice. I like the visual there of those birds. Ricardo said, when someone shows me empathy, I can ease my mind back to a peaceful farm. Yeah. Ricardo, I love that you you made that such a, a somatic embodied uh, description there that when you feel the empathy from somebody else, you you transport to a serene place. Melissa, it helps empathy helps to look at the bigger picture of what someone is going through. Yeah, helps us zoom out. The thing that's happening right now is connected to a lot bigger. Antonio said, open questions, feedback, suggestions, and challenges to reach goals. Perfect. And Josh said, seeing someone as a person outside of the box or frame of work. Yeah, thanks, Josh. We show up impacted by all the things that are happening throughout the day. If you are still working on that, please do. I'm going to get back to the slides, um, and I'll come back to these cards so that if you are still working on that, we can still see and hear your voice. And if you have thoughts, too, that you want to drop in the chat, you go right ahead. We'd love to see that. Okay, so we're connected. We're a little bit more connected, I hope, to, to ourselves, to each other, and to what's our purpose, our purpose of talking about empathy and engagement in the workplace. One of the things that, that's really critical as we talk about, uh, about adversity, when we talk about stress, is that this paradigm shift right here. If we are conditioned to ask this question that's on the left, and we get it ourselves a lot too, What's wrong with you? If I ask you that question, you might have a series of responses. You might like hold up your fists and be like, I'm going to show you what's wrong with you, <clears throat> right? Or you might have a bit more of the, the opposite end of the spectrum of, I don't know, you're important to me. Tell me, you tell me what's wrong with me or, you know, anywhere in between. So it could incite resistance. It could incite aggression. That question is, is, uh, can feel, it, it doesn't feel good. It's uh, pathology based. And also we hold it within ourselves a lot of times uh, and, and use that against ourselves. We think about, I was, I was working with a, a, a group this morning um, who is doing really important work on hunger here in the triad and in Northwest North Carolina. Uh, and we were talking about like guilty pleasures, guilty food pleasures. I was talking about Oreos. Ooh keep the oreos away because i they're just so I, once i start it's hard to stop and so i even as i chase that mindset down i can hear within how i relate to myself i hear that mindset of what's wrong with you why can't you only just eat two oreos so think about no recognize if that comes up for you and know that that that's just what we've been given and the important shift that we want to do is shift from saying what's wrong with you to what happened to you. When we shift our mindset from what's wrong with you to what happened to you, it opens up strengths. It opens up interest. It opens up um, narrative. Because when we recognize that that our needs and our um, our needs and our wants and our desires those drive our behavior, then we can recognize what what we see on the surface. Um, and this is this is the kind of the, the depths of empathy, then we recognize that what happens, what's, what we see on the surface is driven by those things. Also, we want to talk about this idea of what's happening. So that recognizes that stress and that trauma are living live things that, um, that they impact us and that we often are prepare ourselves or, or to get our needs met without necessarily knowing exactly how to do it. So we're moving from what's wrong with you to what happened to you, what's happening in you. And then the last one, what's strong in you. And that's really to look at even in the most challenging behaviors in the most difficult behaviors that we see, whether that's in ourselves, if that's in a colleague, if that's in a kid, if that's in a customer, whoever it is that whatever the, the behavior is, there's something strong in it. There's a strength. So we talk about, uh, 
if I talked about, you know, a kid who uh, is going to, they're going to fight. They're going to, uh, they're going to fight for themselves. The strength that's in that is that they are an incredible self-advocate. They know their worth and they know their value and they're not going to, uh, they're not going to believe something that's not true about themselves. So think about that too. And it's also, it can be really helpful to, um, to think about what other people have told us in our life. So uh, here for just a second, I would love to hear um, whether you want to come uh, to unmute yourself and, and share it aloud, hear your voice in here, or if you want to type it in the chat. What's some feedback you have received from, from people in your life about what's strong in you, whether that's a compliment or that's a, a been in an annual review? Share out what's something that that's strong in you. And I'm going to ask you, Antonio, if you would, if anybody's putting anything in the chat, would you uh, read it aloud for us? Drop it in the chat, come off mute. Let me hear, what's something that's strong in you? Hi, Dr. Iberfaro said he've heard, he has heard that he is, he is very supportive yeah in the short time that i have uh, have interacted with dr fobara i can absolutely say i i see that in you that you're supportive what else what else is some strengths that that because these strengths that that we have individually are also contributing to our collective resilience what's feedback you've gotten We got some from Melissa. She is spunky. Uh, Lori, intuitive, and Kiana, confident, and Nick Lay, genuine. Yeah, I love it. Thanks, y'all. Thanks for sharing those strengths. Keep it going. And if you if you think of something as we're continuing through this, recognize that these these uh, this self affirmation, this practice of recognizing what's strong in you, that's that. Part of that is holding on to empathy. As you experience stress and as you uh, face adversity, that those strengths are things that, that help you ride through uh, challenges. And that's what makes us resilient. So here's some, some uh, we're gonna talk here in just a second about the science of stress and the science of trauma. And I wanted to really kind of give you a little lay of the land on, on where this impacts us um, in the workforce in the United States. So 83% of US workers suffer from work-related stress, with 25% of those folks reporting that work is the number one stress in their life. At some times, yeah, work is the most stressful thing. This is where we spend at least 40 hours a week, right? And it's impossible to, for us not to carry some of that over towards home. We can't, we can't really divide ourselves like that. Roughly 1 million Americans miss work each day due to stress. 76% of US employees report work stress impacting their personal relationships. So that, that movement of work stress, that's gonna impact uh, your other friendships or um, relationships with neighbors. And the last one here, U.S. businesses lose $3 billion a year due to workplace stress. That's a lot of money. And what we see is it, in what, uh, what stress does to us in work is it makes us less productive, less engaged. Sometimes if, if the, the stress turns into a toxic or allostatic load, we're starting to look towards other work. We see that with the, uh, the great resignation, right, people being added more responsibilities with no additional time or no additional compensation uh, and increased absenteeism, people just not showing up, which is them protecting themselves. The promising news though, those things are, it, it can be hard to hear that. Uh, the good news 
So Google back in 2012 did um, a, pri a, a study across, uh, across 180 different teams. Google is massive. And they were trying to figure out what, what is it that makes their best teams successful. And so across those teams, across their most high functioning teams, they saw three things. Number one was conversational turn taking. So the ability, the, the, um, the quantity of conversation that teams have is important. The cadence, the, um, the back and forth dialogue, that that is, a, a, is something that is a direct correlation towards um, success in teams. Second, average social sensitivity. We're not even talking about above average or, uh, or excellent, just average social sensitivity. And the last one, which is the most important, what gets a lot of attention in the organization development world is psychological safety. And so really to, to build up psychological safety, the things that we're looking at doing are framing work as a learning problem, not an execution problem. So when we find that um, that sometimes in our work we we miss the mark or we we're not we don't reach the goals that we set, well this is a learning opportunity. This is this is not about uh, trying to find somebody to to blame, but this is an opportunity for us to use uh, use every every learning experience to to help make us stronger. The second one is acknowledging your own fallibility. We're all humans. Trust is a, is a buzzword for psychological safety, and I appreciate uh, the, the um, Patrick Lencioni, who write, wrote the five dysfunctions of a team model, talks about safety as um, not that I know Dr. Fubara to, um, and I want to put him into a box and make him predictable, um, but that I know him enough that I can show that I'm a human and that I'm in progress, that I'm constantly developing and know that he's not gonna use that vulnerability to harm me or to take that somewhere else. So it's about showing up as a human. And then the last one, model curiosity. This is to build psychological safety. Model curiosity and ask lots of questions. So the, our antidote to, to workplace stress is our psychological safety. So we're getting into some, some science of stress here. Uh, stress is not a four letter word. It's not a bad thing. Doctors want us to have stress. Our coworkers want us to, to have positive stress. Um, the whole purpose of exercise is to stress our heart, to build muscle, to, um, to make sure that, that we are, are healthy and taking seriously the things that are around us. So, uh, think back to when you were in high school or in college and you needed to take a test. That positive stress is what made you show up and made you study and made you do your uh, do all the homework that you needed to do. So positive stress is, is so we, we think about stress uh, in these three terms of positive, tolerable, and toxic. We need to have positive stress. It's important and it's good for us. That middle range of, of stress is that tolerable stress. And the real difference here is that it's difficult. It's something that's hard. And the people that are around us, the resources that are around us are what help us get through that. So think back in your, your recent working career and think about a, maybe something that was challenging for you. Maybe it was a project or maybe it was a specific um, interaction or maybe it was working remote for the first time ever. Think about what that was and uh, think about your, at, at the time, it may have felt insurmountable. It may have felt like it was, there's just no way I'm going to get through this thing. And we did, we made it through. And think about what were the supports that were in place, whether it was a coworker, it was a, 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 a loved one, it was something that you, a new routine, there was something that helped you get through that stress. So positive, we, we need positive stress, we need tolerable stress. We need to know that there's those resources around us. And that last one, that toxic stress, this is really where we're talking about that the absence of supports. So the, the prolonged um, activation of our stress response without any um, supports around us, which is where, so we, uh, when we see that that stress, we all have these these responses: um, fight and flight, 
you you probably know and have heard that it's a bit more expanded now. We're talking about fight, flight, freeze, appease, and collapse are the kind of five major stress responses. And we do it all the time. Uh, when we have prolonged exposure to stress, it may change the the um, hardwiring of our brain. This is we're getting a little technical today, um, but that's to to understand and, and recognize um, so that we can have empathy with ourselves and then be able to extend that empathy to others. That stress, when it's prolonged and there's not any buffers, it can change the hardwiring hard of our brain. But also, um, stress is important. Think about uh, if you were walking on a trail, you're out for a lovely hike, it's beautiful, and you stumble upon a bear, you're going to have one of these five responses. You might uh, start screaming at the bear. That would be a fight response. Awesome. You might turn, you might pivot and start running. You are faster than Usain Bolt, like fat, you just uncovered uh, miraculous speed within yourself. You might be a freezer. That's my typical go-to stress response. Freezing is like you've stopped in place and you don't know what to do. And your whole nervous system is saying, pause right here. Appease uh, might be like, <laughs> You go over to the bear and you like open the mouth of the bear and you just stick your head inside. Uh, not realistic for the, the bear scenario. And collapse is really about uh, when we see prolonged over, uh, over response of the, the stress uh, of the nervous system, stress on the nervous system, we see collapse of the nervous system. So think, think about uh, a, a, anything that stresses you on the daily daily basis, it's driving, uh, and you get cut off, and that that quick dump of of cortisol of the of uh, adrenaline that your body is responding to may push you towards um, one of these responses, and your body needs a way to get that out. Uh, and if we don't get that that stress out, if we don't mitigate stress, it can turn into trauma. Trauma is a response um, to to when your internal and external resources are overwhelmed, um, or the, they cannot uh, respond to a stimulus. So something that's that is important about trauma is that disruptions in attachment are universal. Uh, the human stress response is universal and trauma and, and adversity are everywhere. Our families, our organizations, our cultures all have the capacity to hold uh, and experience trauma, which is important. When we think about it, not just on the personal level, but when we think about it from an organizing principle, then we can recognize that sometimes maybe we have practices, policies, procedures that made sense at one point, but they don't make sense anymore. And maybe we need to shift some things So this Bessel van der Kolk, um, his uh, definition for trauma is traumatization occurs when both internal, internal and external resources are inadequate to cope with external threats. I'm gonna go, uh, so this, I'm talking about the brain a little bit. This is what we typically think about the brain as we think about all these different centers. It's okay, you don't have to be a brain scientist to know uh, to know the impact of your brain. So this, uh, if you know this model from Dan Siegel, awesome. If it's your first time seeing this, get ready. This is so exciting. So uh, Dan Siegel talks about um, your, th this is a quick way to think about your brain. This right here, your wrist would be kind of your, uh, your spinal cord, and this is what is the first part of your brain that forms. This is what controls your automatic responses, like breathing, um, your all your uh, the the neurons that move to your arms and your legs to move your body to get around. If you fold your thumb in right here, this is where your limbic system is, and there's a little almond-shaped part of your brain down here that's called your amygdala. Your amygdala is the center of your brain where um, that fight, flight, freeze response occurs. And it's it occurs quicker than you know 
um, that you're stressed. So before you have realized that you are fighting the bear, uh, because that happens up here in your, your frontal cortex, your frontal cortex, uh, your amygdala has taken care of your body. It has gone into that fight, flight, freeze response to take care of yourself. If you fold your fingers over, all of this right here, your, your uh, prefrontal cortex, that part of your brain doesn't stop growing until about 25, 26 years old. Um, so that's why when we're in our early 20s, we sometimes make bad decisions. This is where executive functioning uh, lives within our brain. This is where um, thinking about the future, judgment, uh, all of those things. And way down here at the tips of your fingers, this is the part of your brain where empathy lives. So um, what happens is when you're, um, we talk about flipping our lid, when someone flips their lid, their prefrontal cortex, the, the amygdala is driving the bus. Your amygdala has, your experience in an amygdala hijack, and it is driving everything. You cannot access the empathy that you have uh, capability of doing. You cannot, it's, it's more difficult to access um, executive function, planning for the future, all of those things that exist up here in the prefrontal cortex. And so what we have to do is we have to regulate ourselves to bring our, our nervous system back down into a place of, uh, into regulation and uh, let our body know that we're okay. So that's, that's a, a quick primer on the brain, hand model of the brain. You can teach this to kids. Uh, teaching, learning through teaching is a really great way. So if you have kids at home, you can, uh, if you wanna see this again, you can Google Dan Siegel hand model of the brain and watch him talk through it. And then you can teach it to your kids. It's a really great way. Uh, to learn about how our nervous system is working. So one of the tools, and this is going to be the, the kind of crux of today, one of the tools that we have um, through the Center for Trauma Resilient Communities and uh, something that we use on a daily basis before every meeting, this is our, our connection before content tool, is something called the community meeting. It's an opportunity for us to check in with each other. Um, it's it has some it has structure to it, so it, it's the same every time, and you know what to expect. Um, it's these three questions: How are you feeling? What is your goal? And who can support you? This all comes from um, something called the Sanctuary Model, which was created by Dr. Sandra Bloom, and this is really an opportunity for us to check in. What's the what, what it, it's a containment tool when you walk into a meeting and you're feeling stressed because you just came from something else or you are just distracted or you don't know what the goal of the meeting is i don't know why we're having this meeting this is a, a way for us to check in with each other before we get into the content so that we we know what what's going on and can take care of each other so i'm going to walk through the science behind this so this question of how are you feeling it's really important to remember that that feelings, some, sometimes we can um, get into to patterns of, um, of thinking that feelings aren't important or that they're touchy-feely. And it's, a, it, it's really important to know that feelings drive our behaviors. Feelings um, can be categorized as good or bad, but that's not really a, a great paradigm for us to think into. A better paradigm or more useful one is that feelings indicate our, our needs are being satisfied or our needs are not being satisfied. And that comes from um, the work of, uh, from the nonviolent communication. It's also important for us to recognize that feelings are extremely contagious. So that's really talking about mirror neurons and that's talking about polyvagal nerve theory, that a regulated nervous system can regulate other people's nervous systems, just like a dysregulated nervous system can dysregulate others. This question of how are you feeling can help us to build our emotional intelligence, um, give insight on how to approach others. Uh, and often when we are most stressed, we are, are getting disconnected from those needs. So this right here, if you've never seen a feelings wheel, this is a really great tool. You can um, search, for, you can type in feeling wheel and find this, and you could set it as your phone background. If, uh, when, when you're walking down the hallway, you know that you pass somebody and say, how are you? And they say, good, fine, all right, okay. Those are all ways that you would describe a sandwich or a state of being. It's not a feeling. 
the feelings wheel can help us to expand that, that vocabulary. So you can see there in the middle, there's those six major emotions. And as you go out, it gets a little bit more specific. So if this is a helpful tool for you to, to expand that emotional intelligence language, and to again, help us to recognize what are our needs, whether they're satisfied or unsatisfied, then use this tool, um, keep it nearby. You can print it out. Um, I, I'm currently getting printed some Frisbees with feeling wheels on them. So they're a, a useful tool um, but that you can also play with. So the feelings help, help us to expand our language there. The next one, the next question. So we've got, what are you, uh, or how are you feeling? Uh, another thing that's important is that there's a, a word called alexithymia. Uh, and alexithymia is the, uh, is what happens when we have a disconnect between our feelings, what's happening in internally um, and words. I don't know how I'm feeling. I can't put a word to, to what I'm, what's my current emotional state. That's called alexithymia. And so when we, the, the inverse of that, the, the antidote or the, the solution there, when we experience that is to, to recognize, you know what, maybe my, if I can recognize my needs, then maybe I can recognize what, what's my emotional state. If I'm hungry, then I know that I need to eat. If I'm lonely, I know that I need connection. So that second question, first question, how are you feeling? Second question, what is your goal for our time? Again, get, getting back to that, that, what I introduced, how I introduced this tool. You've been in a meeting where you don't know what the meeting is for, or you've been in a meeting that should have been an email, or you, um, there's a lot of different difference in perspective on what's the, the goal or the purpose. So by asking what's the goal, we're making clear, we're getting the collective understanding. What is it that, that we're here together for? What's your buy-in for this? So we're creating opportunities for people to, to make clear, this is what I need from this meeting. Um, and something that's really important with, with goals, when we experience stress and we experience trauma, we can have a hard time seeing the future. We can have a hard time seeing what's next because we get stuck in hopelessness or, or um, feelings of, of stuck. Um, and so when we look towards the future, when we look towards hope, we can envision what's next. So that's part of, of us building uh, uh, resilience for ourselves and each other. Uh, and also this, this piece about if we know each other's goals, then we can create a sense of community uh, and help us to establish priorities. And again, that first question, uh, how are you feeling? Second question, what's your goal? And the third question, who will you ask for support? So another impact of, of chronic stress and uh, activation of our, our, our stress response and, and then turning into uh, trauma, what happens is that we get disruptions in our attachment and our, our relationships, and we have a hard time understanding that we are connected. And so we start to think that I'm the only one who can support myself. And that's because when I've asked for support before, I've been left out or, or nobody responds to me or whatever's the, the kind of learned experience. So it's really important for us to ask this question to recognize that we are interdependent on each other uh, and we are not isolated. And it, it, it's also a really good opportunity for us to, um, to be specific. So sometimes uh, as I've used this tool with countless organizations and with young people, something that can happen is that, that we'll say, anybody can support me. But what's, what's really important is to be specific. I need Antonio to support me today. And then Antonio and I have this connection. Antonio's got me and I've got Antonio. So again, here's that why we're asking, this is all, all connects to, to this, the science of stress and trauma. We want to ask about feelings because when we have that over uh, activation of stress and turning into trauma, then we get disconnected from our feelings. So we've got to check in. Our feelings indicate what we need. They indicate what's going on for us. We ask what's the goal so that we get collective buy-in and we have collective engagement. 
and also to help us uh, plan for the future, plan for what's next, next to look towards um, what's possible. And the third question, who can support you? And that's about us being connected to each other, that we can't do things alone. Um, we often think about, that. this is a, a really helpful visual to, uh, to think about behavior and, uh, and feelings. When we see a behavior, again, this gets back to, uh, to hungry or lonely or any of the, the really clear feelings that indicate um, unmet needs. When we see the behavior, I'm looking for food in my cupboard. Uh, well, then that can indicate what's underneath the surface. We see the iceberg, we see the tip of it, we see uh, people working frenetically, or we see people um, feeling it looks like burnout. Well, then we can recognize, or we see people who are, who are um, really happy at work. We see people who are encouraging others. We see them, they're the ones who always fill up the, <laughs> the printer with paper at the end of the day. They're the person who is talking to others. They bring in the cupcakes uh, for coworkers' birthdays or, or whatever's the, the behavior. Then we can see what's the feelings, wants, needs, what's driving that behavior. Now we're gonna have to do a little bit of, uh, of trickery here with, uh, with being virtual. Um, typically in a community meeting, you would make a circle if possible. And what's, what would happen is uh, if Antonio is, is next to me, I'm gonna ask Antonio, how are you feeling? And Antonio is gonna respond to me. And then I'm gonna say, Antonio, what's your goal for today? And Antonio would respond. And then I would say, who could support you? And then Antonio would respond to that question. And then it would get passed to the next person until it goes all the way around the circle. And that really recognizes that everybody is, is important and it, it recognizes a, a kind of flattened hierarchy uh, so that, that we have everybody engaged to recognize that, that everyone's important. Um, and uh, again, the things that, that we want to kind of avoid when you think about, when you hear that question, um, how are you feeling? If your first response is good, fine, okay, all right, recognize, go one step deeper. See if you can tap into a little bit more emotional intelligence and, and tap into what's going on with you and go go there. Recognize too that if there are emotions that are difficult for you, um, that it's okay to, if that's how you're feeling. If there's emotions that are really easy for you to access, then go there. If, if I heard a, an emotion from somebody else or a feeling from somebody else that might feel like maybe they need um, they need some help. It's not the community meeting is not a, a group therapy session, but it is an opportunity for me to say, hey, can I check in with you later? And if they say yes, then I'm gonna follow up with them and say, hey, I heard that you said you were sad. Tell me about what's going on. So there's that opportunity to establish at the beginning of the meeting, to connect, um, establish a connection and engage with each other, but then also if there's needs that are coming in that are impacting us, that we have that opportunity to follow up later. Uh, and also the community meeting is really, it's really great to end with a uh, an inspirational quote. So if there's a, a quote that you can end your time with together, uh, to have that, to center that as your intention or to, to center that as your inspiration um, to, to offer that. Are there, before we try this, virtually, I do have a tool that we'll use. Are there questions about how the community meeting works or um, any of, of that? If not, then what we're going to do is we're going to do, we're going to use a tool called uh, Menti. So if you, I'm going to drop this in the chat here. Oh, look at this. I'm seeing all the comments. Thanks, y'all, for putting that in there. Oh, I love it. Okay. If you go there, so pull up a device. Um, if it's easier for you to access a mobile device, if you got your cell phone, you'll go to, or you can um, click that link. You're going to go to minty.com, which is there at the top of the screen, M-E-N-T-I.com. 
and it'll ask you to put in a code. The code is 4474-5920. 4474-5920. And what'll happen is it's gonna ask you to, to put in a response for how you're feeling. So again, think about, about how you're showing up right now. Maybe you're happy, maybe you're content, maybe you're satisfied. You can put up to three words in there. Sometimes we have uh, multiple emotions coming at one time. So drop in up to three words. We have a word cloud coming. So uh, whatever way that you're feeling, we'll be able to see what's kind of the, the full representation within the room. Nice. And Minty is a, a Mintimeter. If this is a, if you're like really jamming on this tool and have not seen this before, Mintimeter is like um, PowerPoint, but interactive. Um, so you can find that as a free resource online. If this is like really rocking for you, you can create word clouds uh, and other ways of, of engaging people. So we're seeing content, tired, frustrated, focused, anxious, uh, satisfied, disappointed, encouraged, inspired, thankful, fantabulous, old, <laughs> uh, inspired, eager, sleepy, invigorated, open, disappointed, impatient, uh, I think liberated maybe, sore, Cool. I'm going to wait just another th uh, 10 seconds, and then I'm going to advance it to the next the next slide, where you'll be able to to put in your goal. So think think about for the rest of the day. If you're already put your emotion in, thank you so much. Think about for the rest of the day. What's a goal that you have from now until shut eye time, and it's time for bed. What's a goal that you have? I'm going to advance us. And if you're on your device still, it should have updated. So it's, it's now saying, what's a goal you have for today? So think about what's something that, that you would like to accomplish for the rest of the day. What's a goal that you have? Work out, get 10,000 steps in, yes. Cook a good meal, finish my homework, finish laundry, have a conversation with my parents, hire more people and leave work feeling accomplished. Fix uh, a bank receipt, I think, for Bev. Uh, meet the demand, go to sleep on time, nice. Give yourself the gift of good sleep. Get ahead of your work, productive meetings, hit the water intake goal, yeah. <laughs> Get your fish tank clean so you don't lose any more fish, please. Yeah, hold your kids, yes. Brights, brighten someone's day. Finish job descriptions, nice. Construct, uh, complete job descriptions for construction services. Play ball with the dog. Love it. I'm going to stay here for about another five seconds if you haven't gotten your goal in. If you are already got this in, remember the next question is who can support you? And again, it's important to be specific. So if you have a specific coworker that you can name or, um, or a specific uh, support person, if that's your spouse or a neighbor or a friend who can support you, you're going to name that. I'm going to advance three, two, one. Ooh. There we go. And that should have updated if you're still on that device. Who specifically might you ask for support if you need it? Your partner? Shana? Boyfriend, husband, your team, everyone? 
the caveat with everyone. I typically encourage people to say, uh, to be specific, if you're in a really small team and it's, you know, you've got like three people, the, the response might be everyone. Um, and also be, be careful to know that everyone, sometimes when you say everyone can support me, it's kind of the same thing as saying nobody, it, it's kind of, it, it can fall into a, a place of being no one. So it's a, it, it depends on the context a bit. Heather can help this person. God, Houston and Matt, your roommate, fellow fish enthusiast, Margaret, uh, Raven, Nick Legg, Melissa D, the cooking channel, Evan, my husband, my family, nice. My husband. We got some supportive spouses, we love it. I'm gonna leave it here for another three seconds. In case you're still working. McDonald's, close friend. Sometimes those are the same thing. Sometimes McDonald's is the close friend. Fantastic. Congratulations, y'all. You did your first ever community meeting. Well done. I hope that helped. That felt uh, like containing and that felt engaging and also felt like you were able to tap into empathy for yourself uh, and, and recognize what's going on with us together. Again, this is a tool that you can use at the beginning of any meeting here in my organization. It's how we start every single meeting. So we do, but you know, you might do five community meetings in the same day. Um, and it's a practice that we know that we can rely on and that's consistent, which provides repetition, um, can, which can provide stability. And what's really important here, this is a, a, a helpful visual, is that um, we're gonna face stress organizationally, individually, we're gonna face compassion fatigue, which is made up of, uh, of, of burnout and of vicarious trauma. We're gonna face that, that's gonna be a constant thing. We're gonna face legislation changes, we're gonna face um, pandemics, we're gonna face whatever's the, the, the stress that's uh, outside of our control. And on the opposite end of that, that fulcrum, are our individual and organization resilient practices. So there's tools that we have like this community meeting that we can use to help counterbalance uh, the, the impact of those stressors. And ultimately um, there at the bottom, that fulcrum is, is our self-care practices, our professional quality of life and our organizational health. So that we can build resilience. Got to build connection before we can come, we can correct. We've got to remember that individuals get hurt and healed in the context of relationships. We don't heal solo, we heal in the confines of, of connectedness. It's important to remember that relationships uh, need to be unconditional. That even when we when we make gaps, when we, we mess up, when we miss the mark, we, we still show up for each other. Uh, and also that this is about science. This is not... Uh, while some of it is connected to uh, feeling and emotion, it's also connected to professional boundaries and to research uh, and, and about organization development. So, got about five minutes left. If there are questions uh, or reflections, if there's anything coming up for you, I would love to hear those. Uh, any feedback from me, I would love to hear that too. You can type questions in the chat. You can unmute yourself and share the question. Um, if there are none, I would also invite you to share uh, either something that you felt, something that you learned, or something that, uh, an action item, something that you might do next. So questions, reflections, anything like that, I welcome that for the next couple minutes. Nick Lay is here. Sherry Lay, thanks for saying that was fun. Yeah, um, Dr. Favara, thanks so much for asking that question. Um, it, it requires, so the, the community meeting requires everybody. 
So if it's if you want to bring this tool to a team that you exist on or that you're a part of, you can bring it there. Uh, it might you you may need buy-in from your um, whoever is the convener of the meeting or the con convener of the team, but it's a great way to say, hey, you know what? Here's this this um, researched um, science-based tool that we might be able to try, and it may not go right the first time, just like every intervention does not go right the first time, uh, but it comes with practice. Thanks so much for that question, Nick Lay. We all need your wisdom, sir. Uh, Kelly liked the yeah. part of feelings being uh, important because <clears throat> Andrew, uh, yes. yeah, I was quite, I was quite surprised that somebody put my name up there to be able to provide support. And then, and when I put that comment in, uh, there's like seven hearts saying, you know, uh -huh. yeah, I took that, they need my support. Uh, I am one of the most executional operational driven people in, in this business and have been accused many times of being abrasive non-empathetic and very blunt so uh that uh the the response to that was very humbling to me uh because it, you know in our review i was the one that told you i have a hard time expressing empathy verbally but uh, you know I, I do much better with just doing actions uh yeah. so uh that that was humbling thank you uh to the rosewood team oh i love that thanks nick thanks for speaking that out Nick, you should, it sounds like you show up and that the action is, is seen and felt. There's a saying that uh, people will, won't remember what you said, but they will always remember how you made them feel. And I think that that, I think maybe that that's what people are experiencing with you, Nick, is they know, they know how you make them feel. Any other questions responses reflections anything like that before we wrap up our our time together all right well thank you guys for joining uh november's leadership live and thank you andrew uh, thank you for showing us that cool uh millimeter i'm i that was actually pretty fun to use so Thank you very much for participating and uh, happy Thanksgiving. Thanks everyone.